Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Uh, for those in-house, we would appreciate that last moment courtesy check that our various mobile devices have been silenced, are turned off as we prepare to begin. And for those watching online now or in the future, you're welcome to send questions or comments to us at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our program today is Robin Simcox. Mr. Simcox is our Margaret Thatcher Fellow in the Mar Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. He specializes in terrorism and national security issues. Prior to arriving here at Heritage, he was a research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society a foreign policy think tank in London. He has testified before Congress on multiple occasions, provided evidence before parliamentary committees as well, and his commentary appears in a wide variety of both British and American newspapers. Please join me in welcoming Robin Simcox. Robin. Thank you, John, and I welcome everyone to the Heritage Foundation to um, take part in a discussion uh, I think is particularly relevant and a particularly relevant time to be having this conversation because U.S. CVE policy, the primary aim of which essentially is to reduce the threat from terrorism, I think is in flux at the moment. Um, this is partially down to change in administration and a seeming shift in how DHS, the Department for Homeland Security, views CVE. Um, the Obama administration's preference for local community-led initiatives. Um, George Salim, the recently departed director of the Office of Community Partnerships, described CVE as the first federal assistance program devoted exclusively to providing local communities with the resources to counter violent extremism in the homeland. In the last days of the Obama administration, DHS announced $10 million worth of CVE grants to 31 organizations that reflected this preference. Yet with the Trump administration's seemingly more skeptical view of CVE's worth, re-evaluation of these grants have taken place. It appears as if DHS is now trying to recalibrate CVE away from a community-driven approach and more towards law enforcement. A whole range of police departments have had their CVE budgets increased, Feel-good community projects with perhaps less accountability and metrics, metrics for success seem to have been sidelined. So that's just one of the topics we could discuss today, but there is clearly much else that also needs to be addressed. Who are the best partners to work with? Should there be a strict criteria for engagement with certain groups or partners? Do all extreme ideologies need to be tackled as part of CVE? What lessons can be taken from European countries' efforts? and applied here in the US? And ultimately, how do we measure its success? We should hope these questions are answered soon because it feels like at times there's been rather more talk about CVE than there has been action. Luckily, we have a truly stellar panel here today to help us address some of these questions. Um, speaking first will be Mohammed Fraser Rahim, the Executive Director, North America for Quilliam International. He's an expert on violent extremism, issue, extremism issues and a scholar on Africa. Prior to his current role, he served as a senior program officer at the U.S. Institute of Peace, where he led their Horn of Africa programs and served as an expert on CVE issues. Mr. Fraser Rahim's area of speciality are on transnational terror movements, Islamic intellectual history, and Africa. He worked for the United States government for more than a decade, spending time at the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and the National Counterterrorism Center, providing strategic advice and executive branch analytical support on CVE issues to the White House and the National Security Council. Mr. Fraser Rahim is a PhD candidate at Howard University in African Studies with a focus on Islamic thought, Muslim communities in the West, and violent extremism. After him, we'll be hearing from Seamus Hughes. Seamus Hughes is the Deputy Director of the Programme on Extremism at George Washington University. He is an expert on terrorism, homegrown violent extremism, and CVE. He regularly provides commentary to media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and the BBC. He's testified before the US Congress on multiple occasions, 
previously worked at the National Counterterrorism Center, serving as a lead staffer on US government efforts to implement a national CVE strategy. Prior to NCTC, Hughes served as the Senior Counterterrorism Advisor for the US Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. So would you please give a big round of applause as we initially hear from Mohammed. Um, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Um, I want to thank the Heritage Foundation, um, and particularly Robin and his uh, colleagues, uh, a good friend who we've come to a dialogue with, and particularly I respect, particularly the transatlantic connection of British and Americans coming together as well. Um, also, Seamus, too, as well, who's a good friend, and we've worked side by side in our experience as former government officials in the counterterrorism space as well. Um, for those, first off, who aren't familiar with Quilliam, uh, Quilliam has uh, been an organization that works on counter-extremism. Uh, we work on the issue globally, and we are now in North America. And so my role is now the new North America uh, director in looking at these issues, particularly the, the threat of violent extremism, um, certainly in the United States, but also globally as well. Um, we are composed of individuals who themselves have been formers. Our founder, Majid Nawaz, was a former extremist himself, um, who was a member of Hizb al-Tahrir, and certainly uh, has uh, recanted those views um, and has gone through a process of sort of de-radicalization, uh, rehabilitation himself. And we have others. Um, and so our interest is how do we come up and deal with issues as it relates to preventing violent extremism globally, and in this case, the United States. So this is very timely. I want to start off and begin with, I think, the big elephant in the room, which is a very important to highlight which is that the threat of violent extremism varies. This is not just an issue of Islamist extremism. This threat varies from far-right nationalists, includes eco-terrorism, domestic terrorism, and certainly those, as I mentioned from the beginning, Islamist-based organizations that skew to, uh, that offer a very narrow, strict interpretation of Islam. It's very important to recognize that the threat varies and that there is a spectrum. So I wanted to highlight that very much up front. Um, that spectrum varies to the point where um, Richard Collins III, if you remember very recently, the African-American student who was a member and just recently was soon to graduate from Bowie State University, was killed by a uh, white nationalist by the name of Sean Urbanski. In June 2015, in my hometown of Charleston, South Carolina, Dylan Roof, um, carried out an attack against friends of my family um, at the Emanuel AME Church. And we also have the incident in May uh, 26 in Oregon that killed two individuals um, who were protecting Muslims and also individuals who happen to be uh, African American as well. So the threat varies, the problem set varies, and finding a surgical calculated response is at the core of what we all are trying to be involved with as well. Based off of the data that we've seen as well, New America Foundation is just being one, has indicated um, that 48 people um, uh, in the U.S. were killed by far-right affiliated groups compared to Al-Qaeda or ISIS-related groups of 45. Um, the Orlando shooting is hard to determine the exact motive. But again, there's a number of data points you could look at, whether it's START or other organizations um, that obviously uh, can provide commentary on this as well. I think the threat, too, as well, as we look at this, there's certainly an external reality, the fact that we're dealing with this issue globally, whether it is in Africa, whether it's in the Middle East, or whether it's in other locations throughout the world, and we must find ways to address that reality and then also how it uh, lands back into the United States as well. It's important, too, as well, to highlight that this issue that we're dealing with oftentimes has been conflated between CVE issues uh, regardless of the terminology used, but let's just use that as a common term at this moment. And those who see this as a largely counterterrorism uh, issue as well. Um, oftentimes we've seen individuals who have one-dimensional viewpoints on this, and that, uh, that oftentimes limits individuals' perspectives in how we address and find out with real and tangible solutions as well to the response. Um, American Muslims in particular are struggling to address this issue as well. Um, 
Muslims, like Christians, like Jewish community members, have diversity of viewpoints. Islam, the Islamic community, American Muslims in particular, are not a monolith at all. They are, there are Arabs, there are Southeast Asians, there are African Americans, there are white converts, and our viewpoints on this matter will vary. Um, I'll offer some, some, some particular programs and efforts that will really drive this home in a second. But it's important to highlight that this viewpoint particularly varies, and because there are various vantage points that individuals have, it also dictates in how we find appropriate and effective responses as well. For Quilliam in particular, to look at real world tangible solutions, we have been engaged with, since we started in April, on practical solutions in which we can engage with real programmatic efforts. One of these efforts is a critical thinking program, which we have been working with uh, in Washington, now in New York, and as well in Minneapolis, uh, should be coming in soon as well, where we've been working front lines with individuals who have experienced, uh, who have gone down the path of extremism. Finding real practical efforts that address their concerns, whether it's educational efforts, combined with religiously sound-based education as well. Again, we offer one viewpoint out of many other viewpoints that are out there, are, are many per other perspectives that are out there as well. Also, we have engaged with point-to-point -point efforts in de-radicalization as well. There are individuals that we have worked with who, are, who have been radicalized, and we have worked with them on finding appropriate responses, whether it is individuals who are affected by mental health concerns or individuals who are, have dealt with uh, theological challenges and finding ways in which they can find alternative expressions as well. Lastly, I will highlight, we have also worked with our soon, uh, we've assisted with uh, the, you probably have heard of the, one of the programs with uh, um, the new DHS awards. We have, uh, will be part of assisting in the efforts with Masjid Muhammad that has been uh, one of the recipients of the CV award as they find credible, tangible ways to combat violent extremism as well. Um, I think that what I would highlight, just to wrap it up, because we'll have more time for Q&A as well, is that these efforts right here are just a few examples that we're dealing with. There are individuals who are just coming home um, after being incarcerated uh, for 10, 12, 13 years, and they have reached out to us asking for uh, how do they get involved how do they find other ways, whether it's job, whether it's employment opportunities as well? And so the challenge is finding and having the resources that are in place. I can tell you that oftentimes it's limited money that's not available to us to be able to tackle these hard uh, hitting issues. And that requires government response, but also local communities to work in concert with us as well. Lastly, I'll just highlight the role of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, in April of this past year, we know that there was this report that came out with GAO that talked about finding metrics in, uh, that are in place um, that can help find out, are we being successful in what we're doing? And in this particular report, we saw some of the challenges that uh, demonstrated uh, effective responses. I think the jury is still out and finding real tangible so solutions for the short, long, and medium term as well. I'll stop right there, and I'm sure we'll have more time for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed and uh, Seamus. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heritage, for having me, and thank you, Robin, for uh, inviting me. Um, my name is Seamus Hughes. I'm the deputy director of the program on extremism at, at George Washington University. Uh, we look at all forms of extremism, um, but we focused um, our recent work on ISIS in America. So we track all of the cases of individuals charged with um, terrorism-related activities in the U.S. It's about 131 folks as of yesterday. Uh, and there's not a typical profile of an ISIS recruit. Uh, and so my, my current job is looking at that type of scope, the, the threat side of it. Um, but I really got into countering extremism about a decade ago. Uh, it was 2007, 2008 time frame. I was a congressional staffer, uh, and, and my boss ta tasked me to figure out what was going on in Minneapolis with Al-Shabaab's uh, recruitment of young men. And so Went from D.C. to flew out to, to Minneapolis in typical Minneapolis uh, fashion. There's snow on the ground. It's freezing cold. Um, I meet with a lot of different folks there. And the, and the thing that kind of defined what would be my future career was a meeting with um, five mothers of individuals who had joined Al-Shabaab in a basement of the Brian Coyle Rec Center. 
Uh, and so these mothers are saying to me, you know, Seamus, my kids have been brainwashed. They've joined a terrorist organization. Can you save them? Can you help get them back? Um, and grieving mothers. Uh, and so that's kind of how it frames me. At some point in those five families' um, radicalization process, there was individuals who were reachable, right, before they crossed a legal threshold. Because by the time they got on the plane, there's very little the federal government could do. And so I think back uh, when, I, when I was working in government on kind of my extremism, I always think back to that moment and never wanting to be in, a, in an apartment building talking to family members uh, of, this, of this concern. Um, so after I left Congress, um, the Obama administration called my bluff and said, you think you're so smart on CV, why don't you try to implement it? Um, and so I started working at the National Counterterrorism Center. And my main um, gig there was to do community engagement as it relates to radicalization and terrorism, um, going to mosques and community centers around the country. These are very uncomfortable, awkward, delicate conversations um, that, we, that we did at National Counterterrorism Center along with a colleague um, who was at DHS at the time to have these conversations, right? So instead of walking in and saying, you know, I'm Seamus Hughes, I'm from the intelligence community, I want to talk about terrorism, it was more, I'm Seamus Hughes, I'm a father, I want to talk about kids that are drawn into this, and how do we save our kids? And so framing matters quite a lot on countermining extremism, right? It's not just numbers and statistics. Behind this 131 folks that have been arrested for terrorism charges, there's 131 folks with, with brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers. It's 131 folks who were reachable at some point, probably. You're not going to be able to save everybody, but that 17-year-old kid from Minneapolis, we probably could have tried something different. Uh, and so that was, for about three and a half years, I would do that. You know, after three girls uh, in Denver jump on a plane to go join uh, the Islamic State and get turned around in Frankfurt because their father called every phone number in the, Frank in the phone book to get an FBI agent, um, I went to the mosque there at the invitation of the imam and talked about these issues uh, and tried to spark a conversation on this. Um, and sometimes um, it was successful and, and sometimes it wasn't. Um, but I thought it was incumbent on government to have a conversation and to be able to have these conversations in a very open and transparent way. That's kind of where I, f I frame how I look at countering violent extremism. Um, but the, the national CVE strategy uh, can best be defined by a series of fits and starts. So in 2009, the Obama administration announced um, a empowering local partner to prevent violent extremism, which didn't even have an acronym, which you should if you're in government. But um, it was a very long um, strategy, and the idea was three parts. One, understand the threat. Um, there was an understanding and, and a recognition that um, there had been bad and bigoted and you know, misinformed training, and so they, how do we get this training to state and locals? Two, enhance engagement uh, with programs that DHS and DOJ had already had with communities. And three, which is the part that I think um, even the Obama folks would, would admit uh, they struggled the most with, which was countering the propaganda while, enhan while um, promoting our ideals. And so those three um, strategy objectives kind of framed the way they looked at this. Now, like a good strategy um, did, it didn't give a lead or any money behind it. Um, and so you had something called the Group of Four, Department of Homeland Security, DOJ, uh, FBI, and, um, and NCTC, kind of the coalition of the willing. So when I went to Denver, it was me and three of my friends working on, on community engagement in all of government. There were more folks that had died in Syria fighting for ISIS than there were folks doing engagement on these issues. Um, and that kind of speaks to the priorities uh, that we put against this idea of prevention. And so after recognizing that you can't cover a country with three people, um, there was an understanding that we should focus on three different pilot cities. The first being, being Minneapolis, uh, LA, and Boston. Minneapolis, each one took a kind of different flavor, local flair. Minneapolis was focused much more on what they saw as, as root causes, the resiliency issues, um, much more of a broad-based type of uh, engagement. Think of midnight, midnight basketball kind of things, right? Um, LA was much more focused on community engagement, enhancing the engagements they had there. Uh, and then Boston was much more focused on individualized intervention programs. So I got a kid I'm worried about who talks about how great ISIS is. How do I reach that kid before he crosses the legal threshold? And so each city took a different flair. I should also note each city did a, did a different flair with no money. Um, so you had, again, a coalition of the willing, Department of Justice, uh, community partners, NGOs and philanthropies trying to do this. At the same time, because domestic CVE wasn't defined, 
it be became defined um, by others. So there was a, a growing understanding and a growing um, group of, of civil rights and civil liberties advocates who had um, serious concerns and very legitimate concerns about the implementation of, of, of CVE uh, and an administration that didn't um, help define it in a way that made sense. So CVE became the catch-all phrase, the, the cause of and solution to all the world's problems. Uh, and so in, in many ways it was set up um, to have an uphill battle. Now, recognizing there was no, um, no lead and no funding, um, there was, again, kind of a, a reset in the last administration to look at, okay, let's set up a task force of the Department of Homeland Security. Let's put all of the group of four in that um, nice fancy office building, uh, and let's get everyone in a room and talk about these issues. Uh, and so you had um, a three to four time um, increase in the number of staff before what it was just three, now you had 12, um, of folks working on these issues. Their announcement of the grant program, Congress had kind of gotten into the game and said, okay, let's put some money on this. Uh, and, and there was a delay in kind of getting the money out the door because for a variety of different reasons. Now, flash forward to now, we have uh, a new administration that wanted to take a pause on this. Um, they would describe it as a strategic pause. Take a look, hard look at it. Um, there's no built-in advocates, advocates for CVE, right? So either um, if you're on the right side, you think it's, it's too soft on terror. On the left side, you think it's uh, too government overreach. And so in between, you have family members that are grappling with this issue with no tools available to them. Uh, and this is going to be one of these entrappable issues that we just can't figure out how to solve. Uh, we have seen, and I think we will see in the, in the coming weeks, a shift in the new administration away from broad-based countering streams and programs to what they would probably describe as terrorism prevention programs. So individuals that are um, uh, radicalizing to violence, you know, how do you reach those folks, as opposed to 300 people in a room talking about radicalization and terrorism. Each administration is going to have their successes and failures on these issues, uh, especially in an environment uh, that is so uh, politicized, on, especially on this issue alone. So it, we'll see how this, how this goes. The, the, the budget justification zeroes out the grant funding for next year. It reduces the number of people at the DHS task force. Um, so, you know, CV may not actually be able to get off the ground um, as long as it's been around. Um, two other things I wanted to mention, just in, in given um, things to, to be concerned about, and Mohammed is absolutely right. Um, so at the program stream is when we track all the cases, right? And the average prison sentence for a guy arrested for ISIS-related activities is 14.3 years, um, but we've arrested about 500 folks for terrorism-related activities in the last 16 years. Um, about 50 or so have been released from, from prison, and um, because terrorism is a form of crime, there's going to be recidivism in the, in the crime, right? And so you have individuals who kind of move back into society and, and move on. You know, I think of a, a guy I interviewed in, in, in Boston who has a nice IT job and a good family, and then you have an, other individuals I've interviewed who are still... Um, quite extreme in their beliefs. Um, and we haven't figured that out as a public policy question. If someone has served their time, um, do we move on from that? Or is there some level of training? Is there some level of, of monitoring that needs to be approached in that? And the last point in terms of challenges to look at is uh, returning. Uh, we've been very fortunate in the US context to have very small numbers compared to our European partners. 131 folks, um, while unprecedented in the US context, is pales in comparison to my British colleagues, uh, fellow countrymen, uh, with you know numbers of 800 plus who have traveled, um, but there has been a number of individuals who have traveled to Syria and Iraq, who have been and are getting picked up, um, fleeing in Turkey, and are going to have to figure out what we do with these individuals. In New York, we've we've have an individual who's doing one-on-one -on -one interventions and saying, "Hey, kid, I was you two years ago. Knock it off. Don't join ISIS," uh, and that's the approach the U.S. Attorney's Office has taken there. But in Virginia, we've, um, we're going to sentence a guy for, 300, for 30 years for joining ISIS. And so there's no kind of transparency in the system of how we approach this issue. Uh, and I think it's something we'll have to grapple with. And with that, I'll probably end my great remarks. Thank you, Seamus. Um, thank you, both panelists, for a, a really fantastic, detailed look at some of the efforts um, so far. Before I open this up to q and I'm just going to abuse my position as chair and, and ask a a simple but maybe 
Possibly tricky question. I wondered if I could get from both of you one practical thing that you would like DHS to do that you think would improve CVE policy. Yeah, uh, a very uh, quick one. I would, despite having spent my career doing broad-based engagement, I would get away from it. M meaning that I, I think I did a pretty good job when I talked to lots of community centers about this issue, but I can't measure effectiveness of 200 people. Uh, and I'm not sure that's right, my target audience, and I'm not sure that's not going to exasperate the issue. Um, so I would w move away from broad-based engagement towards more one-on-one -on -one intervention programs, which are host would have a host of civil rights and civil liberties concerns, but I think some of these things are solvable. Uh, and if you kind of focus your effort on that, you may have um, a measure of effectiveness. You can go back to Congress and say, I need X amount of money, and this is what works, and that could prove that this works. We, we closed a full field investigation with the FBI because of a non-law enforcement mean. Um, right now, we don't have any of that kind of um, programming. Yeah, I think I would second that. I mean, I, I travel a lot overseas, and they're struggling to find out a, appropriate measures to prevent. I think I would advise um, the person-to-person -person interaction goes a long way. It's something that I know it comes up quite a bit in my experience being on the African continent, whether it's also in Europe as well. So I, I would certainly agree with that. And then secondly, I think it's... Uh, arts and culture. I know it sounds a bit sort of corny, but I think that really engaging with people to mainstream against extremism is vital. Um, that crosses into the line of, is this what government should be doing or not? But I think having uh, the human experience resonates. Pop culture resonates. So we need to find really appropriate um, ways to balance that out. Um, I think the jury will be out on how it, that is to be done, but we can certainly work with them. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'm gonna open up to the floor now. If we could have questions, not comments, that would be terrific. And if you could give your name and affiliation, if you have one, that would also be terribly helpful. Uh, so I have a question in the front row, and then I'll go to the gentleman behind us, if there's a mic. Hi, um, my name is Emily Dyer. I advise the British government on um, their counter-extremism policy. Um, my question is a slightly dry, practical one, but I was wondering where you stood on the, as you said, Seamus, framing uh, matters, definitions matter. I was wondering where you stood on the, the name countering violent extremism. I mean, in, in Britain, we changed our branding from um, PVE, preventing violent extremism, to just simply looking at extremism. I wondered where you stood on that. Thank you, and we'll just have the gentleman behind him, then we'll do. Uh, I'm Namo Abdullah, journalist with Rudao. Uh, I have one question about the prisons in the United States. Some uh, former uh, or, or current even extremists, and some reports have claimed that they are a fertile ground for recruiting uh, terrorists. Can you comment on that? Thank you. Okay, so we've got the name of CVE and prisons. Sure. Um, let's take each one of them. So in terms of prison radicalization, I think um, I have a colleague, um, an academic, that kind of uh, summed up as the spectacular few. Uh, and so you, we do have cases of individuals um, radicalized to violence in prison. Um, JAS out of California is a good example. Um, but it doesn't, it hasn't bubbled up to an issue uh, of uh, mass importance. What usually happens is someone holds an extreme belief in prison and then kind of moves on when they get out. Um, my concern is more um, individuals who've been arrested for material support to terrorism uh, and are provided no um, systematic approach to address um, what got them in prison to begin with. Um, and you've seen um, the executive branch uh, and Bureau of Prisons look at this issue differently depending on the day, right? So. Um, sometimes we house all convicted terrorists in um, Marion or um, Supermax, and sometimes we spread them out. Um, and there's pluses and minuses in this. And I think we saw in the UK uh, structure, they've, they've gone back and forth depending on how they approach it. And I don't think we figured that out in, in a systematic way. Uh, in terms of framing, um, listen, if I'm, if I'm in an academic setting, I can kind of describe what you know, self jihadism is, what Islamism is. Um, I can have this conversation. If I was in a, a mosque and I said, you know, my name is Seamus Hughes, I don't want to talk about jihadism, um, I probably will lose some of my audience. Uh, and so I, I think it's important to, to talk about these things in a very honest and transparent way, but you, you frame it depending on your audience. Um, and, and I don't see the U.S. government moving towards prevention of extremism. 
um, because there's a whole host of, of constitutional issues that would arise um, that wouldn't be necessarily true in other places. Um, you know, the First Amendment and things like that. That said, I don't see how you're going to prevent violent extremism without preventing extremism in some nature. Uh, and so to the extent we have to ask civil society to step up to the plate, um, we have to make that ask, and we haven't. Um, as it relates to the prison, I, I certainly would agree with uh, Seamus on it. I think also um, the same issue with individuals who are incarcerated for drug crimes, individuals incarcerated for uh, manslaughter, there aren't a lot of rehabilitation programs that are in the prison systems that are um, allowing them to reintegrate back into society. So again, I think that needs to be parsed out a bit more. Um, certainly there are efforts, you know, Bureau of Prisons is certainly doing the best of their ability, but I think that that's something that should be explored much more um, at sort of a, a national level. Um, also, I think there needs to probably be a, um, a revisiting of the vetting process of individuals who are providing that spiritual counsel um, just because you're a religious individual, whatever the religion is, doesn't mean that you have necessarily the skill set, the technical expertise to deal with someone who has been radicalized. This is often times that we, there's this assumption that you just put a religious person in there, an imam, a minister, et cetera, and they just happen to have all the uh, skills to deal with this. I've seen and engaged with uh, individuals who probably would have been radicalized themselves so I think that that has to be explored a bit more. Um, in terms of the terminology use, um, yeah, I mean, I think that this, depending on the environment, we're probably fighting over um, saying tomato or tomato in terms of the, the use in terminology. In different environments, it means, you know, using the term Islamism, Islamist gets pushback. Um, I think in the contemporary context that we're living in, it's one of the best terms to capture a very difficult terminology. Um, but again, I think uh, it will vary, I think it will evolve. I don't see a lot of changing in that, particularly with the present administration right now, but I think that um, it's hopeful for perhaps civil society organizations and academics to come up with some offer or offer some solutions. We, um, let me just add one last thing. We, when I was in the administration, uh, or when I was in the intelligence community, every six months or so we get a new executive on CV and they would have a new plan for a new name for CV. Um, and that's all well and good, the framing issue, um, but semantics matters a lot and words do matter, but programs matter a little bit more in this context, uh, meaning that uh, if the only programs we have for accounting and extremism is a community awareness briefing and a community resiliency exercise, that's not enough to tackle an issue um, that had, was at that point rising. Uh, and so I would always uh, encourage my executives to um, stop focusing on changing the words and start focusing on getting me resources and folks on the ground. Um, and understanding the strategic background that you need to have on this, but I really need, I need people uh, at the end of the day. I just wanted to add to as well, it made me think about something, is that the terminology use of CVE, when I have been out, whether it's throughout the world, and certainly in the United States, I don't use the term CVE. What do I talk about? Building trust? tolerance, inclusion, social cohesion, all these good terminologies that actually are trying to bring together communities. You know, words matter, terms matter, and so it's important that we go back to the basics to describe um, this phenomenon that we're all struggling with, and I think that in, if we can find perhaps softer terms, then maybe that's the basis to then find maybe a more surgical terminology that we can all maybe agree with. I, I'm sorry, now I'm going to be contrarian for the sake of being contrarian, too. Um, you don't want to make it so broad um, that it becomes so amorphous that it becomes that catch-all phrase, too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit of a delicate balancing act. Okay, I'll take another two questions. If there's any, I can see a lady there in the second row, and is there anyone else? And they're on the front row. Uh, why don't we go to you first? Why not? Um, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Yasmin. I'm a college student in Maryland. Um, and uh, my question is about how um, both panelists have mentioned a little bit about um, community outreach. Um, and I'm just wondering what specific aspects of that has been unsuccessful that would lead you to say that it's not as effective as one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction. Thank you. And it was the second 
Hi, my name is Erica Vasquez, and I'm a program officer for civil society and peace building at FHI 360. Uh, thank you both for your comments. I really appreciated them. And I had a question that I believe both of you can address, but they're specifically regarding, Seamus, the community engagement and resilience programs that you oversaw and, and structured. And my question had to do primarily with the gendered composition of your team as you engage different communities, and also wanting to know if your approach or strategies uh, shifted or changed depending on your target demographic. So if you're engaging children, if you're engaging men or women. Okay, so we've got um, community outreach, successes or otherwise, and resilience and gender composition. Whoever would like to go first. Sure. Uh, I am a fan of community engagement, um, and, and it falls in the bucket of, of good government, right? Um, government should engage with their citizenry about issues that, that concerns them, right? Um, but in terms of CVE, in terms of, of, of trying to reach an individual who's uh, radicalized into violence, um, that may not be your target demographic. Um, and so that's why I'm saying, I'm not saying don't do community engagement, I'm saying maybe don't do community engagement on the rubric of CVE. Um, and so that's the distinction there. In terms of the, 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 the composition and how we do engagement, it depended on the audience. Um, uh, my colleague Irfan is in the back um, checking his phone, but when he was at DHS, um, you know, depending on the audience, we would switch off, right? Um, there is something powerful about a white Irish Catholic standing up and saying there's no um, profile of an ISIS recruit um, and, and a government official saying that. Um, there's also something powerful about others saying it. Um, and depending on the audience we were engaging with, whether it was a, a traditional or conservative um, organization, um, it may have been my, um, my female colleague who would engage with um, half the congregation. It just depended on, on the situation. Y you do your best to try to get in the door, right? Uh, and once you get in the door, you adjust based on the audience. Um, and you don't want to be forced into it. I, give me an example. I was at a, a mosque one time where the guy, uh, imam there, called me and said, can you come talk to my congregation? And I got up there and he said, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is Seamus. He's from the intelligence community. He's going to talk to you. Okay, I'm already on a back footing, right? Um, I should have, looking back on it, built up a level of conversation with that religious leader before that conversation so he didn't just kind of throw me to the wolves. Um, and so that takes some levels of trust um, for folks to know that what you're going to say um, is informed by, by research, is informed by data, isn't um, inherently um, bigoted or any of those type of things. Um, um, but that takes a level of, of, of work on the front end that I don't think... Um, we had a lot of time for because there was only a couple of us. Um, I think to address your point on community awareness, I mean, I'm, I used to work in the intelligence community. I was part of director of strategic operational planning. I was helping out in the community awareness briefings, being out there. I'm also a, uh, uh, generations have been Muslim in America, and I am an Arabic speaker. I, am, uh, I studied classical Islamic texts in West Africa, in the Middle East. Um, I finished my PhD in this field too as well, and so my experience is it from various angles. It is personal, it is professional, it is academic as well. And so when, 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 when I'm out there and engaging and having left government, and um, I, I say what sort of left the war room, if you will, being in the IC, going to the peace room with U.S. Institute of Peace, and now being out um, working in sort of the nonprofit space, uh, you engage people and connect with them. So it's not this distant person named Muhammad, it's distant person Muhammad who gave the Eid sermon this past year, who is trained in the tradition, who also gets these issues that are very tough in the policy perspective around having been in the policy realm, and then also Muhammad who also serves and engages individuals who are and have been radicalized. So I think that you have to address this from multiple viewpoints and vantage points. Um, certainly activists will have their viewpoints and advantage. Those of us who are in the policy space will try to analyze it in hopefully a pragmatic way that can certainly get it to the nuance as well. Um, also just getting to your question too as well, maybe it was for Seamus, but I'll add my two cents. Um, again, I think you have to be specific based off of the environment. I think one of the things we've encouraged and as I've hired is to have women side by side in this, the, the, the issues that we're dealing with. Um, it, can't just be all male panels, sorry. Um, Katie but, dropped it. it's not on me. <laughs> but, but, but in general, I think it's important to have these diversity of viewpoints as well. 
um, and it's at the core of, of what I certainly encourage. Okay, um, I see a gentleman at the back, and I see, fortunately for the, there's somebody right on the other end as well. Hi, good afternoon. Irfan Saeed from the State Department. Uh, thank you for your comments, both uh, Seamus and Mohammed. Great to see you guys again. Uh, Seamus, you mentioned that uh, the average jail time is about 15 years. So what happens to those individuals who were prosecuted for terrorism offenses about 15 years ago? Um, and they're going to be getting out uh, very quickly. Um, I think if you look at the paintball case, if you look at the Lackawanna individuals, uh, some of them either already are out or will be getting out. Do you think that's enough to jolt uh, the, the government officials to come up with a comprehensive plan for CVE, or is something else needed? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it's enough to jolt. Uh, I was talking to a, a convicted terrorist um, last night, actually, um, moved on with his life and kind of doing good things. Um, but, you know, he's there was nothing that kind of caused him to do that, right? It was all kind of self-awareness and deciding, you know, what I was 10 years ago is not what I want to be now. Um, but you're absolutely right. Individuals who went into jail uh, at the, the height of al-Qaeda are coming out in the height of ISIS or the downcline of ISIS. Um, and what does that mean for uh, engagement? You know, we've seen um, uh, reporting um, by foreign policy of John Walker Lynn um, interested in ISIS, um, the concerns of um, in, inmates inside um, doing that. We have seen also recidivism. So um, one of the highest ranking ISIS American um, folks is um, John Georgilis, and he was arrested and spent um, time in jail. Uh, and then when he was released, he went to Syria and joined ISIS. Um, and so if that's not enough wake up call, I'm not sure what will be. Uh, I think it's, unfortunately, it's going to have to be kind of a a newsworthy event for folks to, to kind of take a focus on it. Um, I would just add to say that, you know, 15 years ago we were dealing with Al-Qaeda. Um, now we have the new kids of ISIS, and so, you know, we'll, we will have to deal with the reality of ISIS um, kids who are getting out. That may be a bit different than Al-Qaeda. And so how do we effectively respond to that? Um, you know, I was talking with one of my kids yesterday, too, as well, who just, you know, just got out, and he needs a job. He is struggling with finding employment. He is struggling with finding opportunities. He's struggling with getting into a university. That's real world situation of if he has done his time, then what are we providing for him? Is that our responsibility? So I'm, I'm leaving that open-ended because this is, these are real things that we're confronted with. Um, their individuals are American citizens and they have to or they want to, the desire is to be reintegrated back into American society. So us not providing that, what happens? If you talk to the, the Bureau of Prisons guys, they'll say, you know, why does a guy who wanted to blow me up get special treatment than, you know, the guy with the drug charges? Uh, and so it's a real question, it's a public policy question that should be debated on this, right? Do we put resources on individuals who have been convicted with terrorism charges? Or do we put our, our resources on um, nonviolent offenders? Um, and what does that mean? Why do you get special treatment if you because you've been arrested for material support to terrorism? These are things that I think are important, but we haven't had this conversation in a kind of a very nuanced and, and practical way. Um, okay, so we had a gentleman at the back there, and then I also see a lady on the second row there afterwards. Great. Hello. Good to see you, Seamus. Hi, Nate. Uh, Nate Snyder, uh, former CDE advisor uh, for the Countering Violent Extremism Task Force and the DHS Office for Community Partnerships. Um, really kind of a quick two-parter. I think everybody on the panel will agree uh, narratives matter, trust matters, optics matter, and I think somebody said earlier, words matter. Um, unfortunately, currently, we have an administration that may be perceived by some communities to be openly hostile with various policies they are pushing. Uh, unfortunately, these are the same communities that we need on the front lines to have that level of trust because uh, there have been many studies in, in regards to bystanders and their ability to report and, and sort of work at the community level to address many of the threats that law enforcement or the intelligence community may not be able to notice. So my question here is, given these obstacles, what do you see um, as ways to overcome this trust gap, for lack of better terms, to ensure that these efforts 
that we're built on continue. And second, uh, domestic terrorism is also playing a significant part in this. I mean, most recently, we heard about the would-be attack in Minnesota um, on the mosque. And again, you have an administration who is not openly reaching out to communities, addressing this. Um, but then, I guess on the second part question, what are the potential perils of narrowing the focus of CVE strictly to a single ideology and perhaps not addressing the domestic terrorist threat? Thanks. Hi, I'm Mahreen for um, Vice President Award. So our organization has developed one of the, um, the first evidence-based community-led um, so-called countering violent extremism programs uh, in, based out of Montgomery County. We've been working with other communities across the US and internationally, trying to train them um, uh, based on some of the good practices and lessons learned uh, that we've had. And one of the things that we keep finding is that you know when we talk about this community-led, community-centric approach, um, we often forget some of the challenges that a lot of local civil society organizations face. They're either struggling because they have limited institutional capacity or they have limited social or political capital that's really necessary to reach out to their local HHSs, their um, health and human services folks, their, uh, their regional FBI field offices, or even their local uh, law enforcement. Um, or maybe they don't even have enough support from within the community to tackle these issues head on because of a lot of the um, sociopolitical baggage that's now associated with the acronym, mm -hmm. right? So in so many words, what we're also now seeing is a shift towards a more law enforcement centric approach. And that certainly seems to be what this current administration is, is encouraging as well. So with that in mind, what kinds of recommendations would you provide for local law enforcement um, agencies that are interested, that are willing to take the lead on this issue um, with a particular eye on some of the, the challenges and lessons learned from the past? Okay, so um, we've got trust gap, uh, the narrowing and focus on domestic terrorism, and advice for law enforcement. Mohammed, would you like to kick off? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think the simplest thing, um, to your point, uh, Mahreen, is, you know, establishing community liaison partnerships, simple, easy, um, low cost, in tight fiscal times. Um, that can probably help uh, sort of uh, dialogue between law enforcement community and certainly uh, communities themselves. Listen, the fact of the matter is it does have a law enforcement matter to this. I think it's a denial to say that there isn't an aspect where it's protecting communities, making sure that public safety is ensured, and there's an aspect of this. But also the other side of the coin, there is communities f needing to find practical ways in which they take ownership and self-police. It'd be no different than if my, my cousin got shot 19 times in the chest and it was a result of black-on-black -black crime. That's an unfortunate incident that I have to tell, and this was when we were all roughly around 17, 18 years old. So there's some responsibility that has to be confronted within the communities themselves and having to take ownership. It's not always pretty. It's not always um, um, sexy. It's sometimes very difficult to look within and look at the reflection. Um, also, just to address your point on um, the domestic terrorism threat, oh, good question. Um, politics matter sometimes, and uh, it's it's not an easy it's 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 not an easy balance. Um, we do have a threat of domestic terrorism. I I, I leave, you know, laid out several early in my initial briefing talking about Dylan Roof, certainly in Minnesota, the events that have uh, transpired all throughout the U.S. That is a real national security concern. That's just as important to address as the rising Islamist threat that we're confronted with and the attacks that are taking place. Um, Governments are probably going to be judicious. The government is going to be judicious in their response on that, but I think it's, it, it has to be pushed. Um, on a regular basis. Sure. Um, I'm going to posit an argument just for the sake of conversation. Um, in many ways, you could argue that um, CVE focused on 
Islamist or jihadist inspired terrorism um, is going to essentially um, normalize the approach you would focus on other um, forms of extremism. Uh, meaning that um, if you have a white supremacist uh, that you're concerned about as a, as a as a cop, your your option in Chicago is to talk to Life After Hate and do intervention programs. Um, if you have a young man who's interested in ISIS, um, your your options are, are few and far between. You know, besides a word and a few other organizations. Um, so in many ways, you could argue that CV is actually providing tools for um, to look at extremism in a way that doesn't kind of frighten folks that we normally would. Um, and and the other argument in terms of other natures of the threat, yes, absolutely. I mean, you should be worried about the Dylan Roofs of the world as much as you are Omar Mateen's. Mm -hmm. uh, and the approaches may be different, um, but sometimes there may be programs that, that uh, work in white supremacist um, context that may be transferable to jihadists and vice versa. Uh, and so, you know, I think you need to prioritize the threat, but you can kind of, you know, chew and, and walk at the same time uh, on this. In terms of the, tr the trust deficit, I mean, I think that's an important question. Clearly, um, the rhetoric hasn't helped in terms of um, communi doing community engagement. Um, we saw a number of organizations um, refuse grant funding um, post the new administration. Some of that, though, was some virtual s virtue signaling, right? Um, some of that was looking at this and saying, I wasn't really comfortable with CV to begin with, and this gives me an out. Um, and that's a reflection on a larger question about the framing of CVE uh, and a larger question about um, how it's been defined. Um, and, and again, very fair concerns by civil rights and civil liberties um, organizations on these issues. Um, but I always go back to that sitting in that apartment building at the Brian Cole Rec Center um, and not having options. And because both sides are polarized on this issue, um, I'm still going to be the guy talking to grieving mothers. And that's not acceptable as a public policy response for me. Um, and we need to figure that out. Uh, and then the last, uh, the, the question about recommendations to law enforcement. Um, you're going to have a series of trials and errors, but um, you know, a bright line between community engagement and law enforcement. Uh, I never shared my notes when I went to Boston or Seattle and met with community groups. I didn't hand my notes over to you know, Muhammad's group at, um, at the IC. Mm -hmm. Just, Red line, um, and that would kind of affect um, things. Now, you can dual track things, but um, you shouldn't share information. Um, and you kind of have to be transparent in the implementation. So uh, throw everything out on, on the web, and you're going to get hits for it, but at least you're transparent on it, and you can argue about it, and you can have an honest debate on it. Uh, and you can't allow your critics to hang that you're kind of doing this in the darkness. Um, and so you have to be transparent on it. We've got time for another round of questions. I've got a gentleman there on the third row, and is there anyone else? If not, we'll just go to you, sir. Hi, I'm Sam Geisbühler. I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of Switzerland here in, in DC. Uh, PBE's uh, preventing violent extremism is obviously an international challenge, a global challenge, and not just an American uh, challenge. And what you said about one-on-one -on -one interventions, about um, dealing with, with returnees from Syria, Iraq, and so on, um, also about community engagements, um, I hear exactly the same stories from, from your colleagues in Switzerland, all over Europe. You all have the, the same challenges, basically. And I wanted to also put, uh, point to an organization which deals exactly with these uh, challenging ch challenges. It's the Global uh, community Engagement and Resilience Fund in, in Geneva. And in this context, I wanted to ask you basically three related questions. What is your experience regarding international cooperation with regard to preventing violent extremism? Where do you see internationally best practices, models, when it comes to preventing extremism? And last questions, where are the front runners, countries which have done a lot where you can learn from them or we can learn from them. So do you have some front runners there, some, some really best practices? Thank you. Okay, international cooperation, best practices. Which countries are doing this most effectively? Sure. Um, um, yeah. Let me take the easy one. Um, because the US, the U.S. in many ways has always been about five years delayed from our European partners when it comes to terrorism, right? Um, homegrown terrorism. It built up a while, um, sometime after um, our European partners. And because of that, um, it allows us to learn from the successes and failures of um, other countries. Uh, and to the extent you can um, see that, I think it's important. Um, 
in terms of best practices, you know, the channel program's been under a, a, a bit of scrutiny on, on this, but you know, the current iteration is one that, that, that's worthy of, of review, I think. Um, this is the UK. The UK same. channel program. You know, again, it had, it had its concerns in the beginning, but I think they're, strike, they're starting to strike a right balance on it. The, the problem with the UK program and trying to translate it here is that they're much more likely to hit it on the front end, like a, a guy starts trolling ISIS online that it would never rise to a level of an FBI investigation uh, in the U.S. context. And it's a lot easier to de-radicalize or disengage an individual earlier on the process um, than, you know, when he's got two FBI agents in a van running eight-hour shifts in front of him. Um, and so we need to build up that civil society front end um, because the back end's too hard. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with uh, Seamus. I mean, I think the channel program is, there's some potentials there. Um, that could be interesting, that could be potentially transferred or borrowed certain aspects, um, so I'd open that up. Also, a pro, um, effort that I was involved with that I think I would highlight is some of the work that Kenya is doing. They have an election today. Um, hopefully things run smoothly. Uh, but there was a report that actually I helped, I was part of, um, that looks at what makes communities resilient. And I'll just give you a few highlights and I can, we can, I'll give you my card and we can do point to point. But one of the factors of what made communities resilient was when there was a shared sense of responsibility and security apparatus. So state security and also civilian securities are working collaboratively side by side. What, secondly, um, intergenerational exchange between elder and younger people seems rather intuitive, but very important. And then lastly is um, the uh, what's dialogue, youth exchange, is um, open communications between um, what's being uh, the issues that are, the grievances essentially too as well. There's about seven others too as well, but just top wave issues. So certainly I would highlight that. And then lastly, I would highlight for selfish reasons, but I think it's something to rarely, something to consider is, I just finished my doctoral dissertation, I'll be defending it next month. Uh, it's on a 42 year kind of radicalization program in the US. And it's with the community of the late Imam Warfdin Muhammad who has a connection over 300 to 400 mosques throughout the US. And this community was able to reject sort of black nationalism, black separatism in 1975, and has produced uh, community members that have rejected this sort of divisive teachings and has not produced a single individual that has been radicalized. I can share with you the findings. I have a New America Foundation report that will be published next month on this and uh, the data set, I think it, you'll, you'll find interesting too as well. There could be aspects that could be borrowed in other Western liberal democracies and other locations throughout the world. Well, I'm, uh, it's not often you can have a discussion on CVE or counterterrorism issues and end on a relatively optimistic note. But that strikes me as a terribly optimistic note to end on. Um, so I would just like to thank Seamus and Mohammed for what I think were truly revealing, informative, and enlightening comments. Thank you to you guys for coming and asking such great and punctual questions and no comments. Um, and please give a big round of applause to our panel.